Welcome to the Epigenetics Podcast from Active Motif. Join host Dr. Stefan Dillinger for lively discussions with leading epigenetics researchers. Hear about their past experiments, what they're working on now, and what's coming next. You know their papers, now get to know them and discover the stories behind the science. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Epigenetics Podcast. Today I'm happy to welcome Cappuccino van Richem from Stanford University on this show. Please let me briefly introduce you to our audience. You got your PhD from University of Lille II in France. You then came to the United States for your postdoctoral training at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center and Harvard Medical School Department of Medicine, where you also became an assistant professor in genetics and instructor of medicine in 2015. Then in 2017, you were appointed as an assistant professor in pathology at Stanford University. A question I like to ask every guest to start off our little podcast is, how did you become interested in biology in the first place and then in pursuing a career in science? So um, I think I've always been a scientist at heart since when I was a kid. Um, so science was really logic for me. But more personally, um, I grew up in um, an hospital settings because my parents were working in hospitals. So I was more on the medical side of things naturally because of exposure and after that when I was in middle school um, my mom got uh, breast cancer and uh, she passed away six years after that and in between my dad got rectal cancer and he passed away also after really shortly after my mom passed away so I think that really pushed me toward um, scientific career doing like cancer research and trying to like do something for that. Um, so that will be like the real reason, I think, why I'm here now. So it's a very personal reason in the end. Yes. Yeah. So coming to your science, uh, let's dive into it. Um, and to speak broadly, it centers around the impact that chromatin modifiers have on disease development and progression so that more optimal therapeutic opportunities can be achieved. In the early days of your research career, you were interested in KDM4A, a histone H3K9 uh, 36 lies in demethylase. <laughs> hard hard to, to pronounce that. And in a paper published in 2013, you looked how overexpression of this KDM4A and Chumanchi 2A influences chromosome stability. Uh, can you maybe talk about this study and what you found? Yes. So that was the beginning of my postdoc. Um, I joined, uh, joined Wettstein Lab when I was, uh, it was in 2010, uh, back then at the beginning of my postdoc, and I was his second postdoc, and his lab was working on KDM4A, and mostly the rules of KDM4A in, trans in um, replication. And so um, this uh, first study was really a study that was uh, led by uh, Josh Black, which now has uh, his own research group at the University of Colorado. And uh, and so together, we actually found that uh, that the overexpression or the stabilization of KDM4A led to a second round of replication of sp some specific places of the genome, and that led to uh, some chromosome instability and, um, and some uh, DNA copy gain of specific region. And interestingly, this copy gain were actually transient, so we could see them appear in S phase, And by the end of this phase, they were gone. So that was very interesting because for the first time, it did show that um, copy gain of DNA can are not necessarily always integrated in the genome and most importantly, not necessarily stable. So they could actually be druggable. And so that's really something that uh, Josh took on in his own lab now and is following up on that. And uh, John Wettstein also is following up Uh, on his side. And that's something that we are not uh, really doing in, in my mm -hmm. own laboratory now. What you then did is you followed up on characterizing KDM4A uh, more, and there are potential non-nuclear or rather non-chromatin functions of KDM4A. Um, so why did you move in that direction and what did you found then, find then about the function of KDM4A? So that was a very interesting um story uh, that I really enjoyed a lot. Um, and it's mostly because, you know, you're doing 
So we were working on KDM4 and its role in replication. And, um, and on the side, I was interested in um, SNP in KDM4. So there is a coding SNP, only one coding um, SNP in KDM4. And uh, that SNP was associated with worse patient outcome in a long, uh, long cancer patients. We were um, doing some uh, analysis with that then. So we were wondering what that SNP could be doing and if we could get any insights of either would it be draggable or could we get like some mechanics, mechanistic insights. So we performed a drug screen in uh, cell lines established from uh, lung cancer. And we screen a whole bunch of like different drugs in collaboration with Serial Benes uh, back at MGH. And uh, what we found is that the cells that were homozygote for the SNP were more sensitive to mTOR PI3 kinase inhibitors than the cells that were either wild type or what we call heterozygote. And so back at the time, so like, okay, so why is that um, cells that would be homozygote for the SNP, KDM4A, will be more sensitive to mTOR inhibitor? What is the link between KDM4A and mTOR? which we could have like absolutely no idea. So I went back to some aspect that I had done early on in the lab where I IP'd KDM4A and pulled down a whole bunch of things that were interacting with KDM4A. And looking back at that data, I see that there is a lot of translation factors and ribosomal protein in there. And so I'm like, oh, maybe it's, there is something into that and maybe it's, it's just the, it's a reality of it. But you know what is known in the field is that uh, if you IP something and you find you find ribosomal protein or translation factors, they call that the crap home. So said like, oh, those are sticky. They're gonna come down everywhere. So I was like, well, but like maybe there is still some, maybe that's real. So I I did some confirmation by immunoprecipitation, and I found that uh, KDM4 actually does interact. Uh, with translation factors, and so that was that was a really interesting story because just by following the data and like you know and like not being like preconceived to some like specific role and following what the data tells you, you end up like in a totally different field of science. So that was actually very very um very interesting. So this is and so I realized in the end that so KDM four A is also cytoplasmic. But only twenty percent of the protein is in the cytoplasm. Uh, but like that cytoplasmic part of KDM4 actually interact with the transition machinery. So if we perform polyson profiling, it sits in those initiating fractions of polyson profile. And if we deplete um, KDM4, we do decrease global translation and we increase sensitivity to translation and translation pathway inhibitors. And so to come back to the SNP part of it, um, that uh, SNP is, changes an amino acid on KDM4A, which make it more ubiquitinated. So the SNP um, part of the protein is less stable. So when there is that KDM4A SNP part, we have less KDM4A in the cell. And because we have less KDM4A, it's like if we were knocking it down or... Uh, inhibiting it with inhibitors, and then the cells are actually more sensitive to translation and translation pathway inhibitors. So this is how all of that and like a lot of things that we are doing now in the lab, this is how it all um, started. And I started to work more on the um, other side of the nuclear membrane, doing some work in, in translation. So how does it get it to the cytoplasm? Does it just stay there or is it like actively re-exported or how does it get there? So we never went uh, that far with the KDM4A. Uh, and so, um, we, I mean, so it's going to be, obviously, it's translated in the cytoplasm itself. So it's going to like start there. So after that, it's go it will go into the nucleus. Is it? Is it going back and forth from the nucleus to the cytoplasm? I would, I would think so. Uh, and like there is certain cues that will like put it one side or the other. Um, but we haven't 
I, we don't have mm -hmm. any details uh, on that. That's something that should need to be follow up upon. Okay. <laughs> so an another maybe unexpected but surely, surely understudied fact of chromatin modifying enzymes is how they control their temporal expression during the cell cycle. You just said that KDM4 acts uh, in S phase. Um, so could you maybe talk about how, why this is important and what you did find about this process with respect to KDM4A? So the, um, so it's everything that we have ever needed to be able to show with KDM4A, you add to um, have the cells synchronized in a specific phase uh, of the cell cycle. If you were just to overexpress KDM4, so we mostly work with overexpression for the simple reason that KDM4 is amplified in many cancers. Um, so, so that's the reason why um, we were mostly working with overexpression of stable cell lines that would have like extra copies of KDM4. And so, but if you were looking in those cells that um, in asynchronous cells that will overexpress KDM4A. And I was doing a lot of chip um, at the time in John's lab, where we will overexpress KDM4A and chip KDM4A at some specific places of the genome where we think it will be um, located. Asynchronous cells, we, we will not see an enrichment of KDM4A by chip, which was really surprising. And if, eventually we will even see a decrease. And uh, so we will like deplete KDM4A from so specific places while it was overexpressed. And that didn't make sense with a lot of like other, other biology we were seeing. And we actually realized it's because um, KDM4 is highly regulated over the cell cycle. And so it's stabilized uh, in S phase and it's very, very low in the G2M. And it's at the uh, protein level, the RNA level is not, uh, doesn't change. And this is all by ubiquitination. So we ended up finding that Uh, it's really all, uh, so it's more ubiquitinated at the end of S phase and in G2M. So it's more turnover. And most of like the role of KDM4A uh, is actually in replication and in replication timing. And so that, therefore it makes sense that it's stabilized in S phase. It does its job in replication. And then it will be uh, less, less present. And so we realized that to be able to see where KDM4A will be enriched in the genome when it was... Um, Overexpressed, we needed to have the cells synchronized in this phase uh, when it was actually the time where we were going to see it at those places. And so everything studying KDN 4A needed to be all synchronized, specific phases of cell cycle, uh, and like the entire, all, all of the study around that protein is actually very uh, cell cycle centric and very specific. So it, it makes you, after that, think about other chromatin modifiers a little different is that say maybe there is others very likely that are regulated over cell cycle and do things at a very specific time of cycle. And if you work with a population of cells that is asynchronous, then the majority of your cells are G1. So you're actually looking at like a G1 enriched population and whatever you're finding is actually are more of like G1. Um, roles, if there were to have roles in specific phase of the cycle. And if you center your research in more of a cell cycle and in specific phases, for a whole bunch of these proteins, you can actually go find new functions or functions that you would not have seen before because not a lot of folks are looking like, especially in late S phase, for example, where like, you know, if you're like early or late in, in S phase, you will have different functions as well. Um, so that's opened up also in a whole new, it's, it's just multiplicate the things that you can be doing. And, and I think the cell cycle is highly relevant to a lot of other, I will talk about chromatin modifiers because this is what uh, I've always been working on and, and we are on an epigenetic podcast, <laughs> but even other proteins. But I think the cell cycle centric proteins are the ones that are known to have cell cycle rules. Folks are really studying them over cycle uh, naturally. Yeah, I mean, there are many, many cycles in the cell, right? I mean, there's the circadian rhythm, there is the cell cycle, and all those things should or need to be controlled for, right? I mean, if you just look at a bunch of 
like population uh, as a, the population of cells in, in any given experiment, like in an ATAC-seq experiment or a cut and tag experiment, you maybe miss out on a lot of information if you're not controlling for the cell cycle or the circadian rhythm, right? I agree. Yes. Yeah. yeah definitely. As this is circadian rhythm is really some things we haven't done at all. But I think yes, you, you should take that into account probably as well. The so cell cycle is a little easier to take into account. Definitely. Yeah. So um, another thing is that so KDM four A is not regulated through chromatin at all. So it's just like regulated at the protein level then. So it's it's just made constantly and then it's just regulated um, by the degradation of the final protein from what we have found yes so it's like it's it, it's transcribed throughout uh, the cell cycle the rna level are really not changing uh it's really stable but it's really regulated at the post transitional level by uh, ubiquitination so it's really uh it interacts with uh some specific killings And and is ubiquitinated by by uh, yeah and so it's and so we it so the ubiquitination increases uh, at the end of this phase and it's mostly ubiquitinated in G2M where its level is the lowest so it's really and so if you were to work with uh, MG132 that um, inhibits a proteasome then you have stable levels of uh, of KDM4A mm -hmm. yeah. But what you then did was to look at replication, replication timing during the cell cycle and how the chromatin state plays a role in this process. So how does chromatin, how do chromatin marks influence the replication timing? Yeah, so this is so that is this is where we went uh, after all of these studies about it was the next um, logical step to us because so every study we had done was. Um, looking at specific phases of cycle, but we would actually use drugs to arrest the cells, like hydroxyurea, that would like arrest your cells in like at the boundary of G1 and S phase, and then release the cells to actually collect at different time points, and you then you, you will have like a, a population of cells that are, is all in the same uh, phase of cycle, or nocodazole arrest, which arrests in G2M, and then same thing, you release all of the population of cells at the same time. But the problem with all of that is that um, those drugs are actually altering um, the cells in some way and uh, and to, to arrest them. So whatever you, the readouts, whatever you're looking after that could be both uh, because you are really at a specific phase of cycle, but also could be like a consequence of the drugs and what the drug did, did in the cell. Um, so what we thought is that uh, in order to be able to really look at only cell cycle centric, just a consequence of the cell cycle, we needed to uh, develop some sort of method where we would not use any drug. And in the meantime, what we wanted to do as well is was to be able to go genome wide and to see by um, RNA seq. Um, what were like the uh, RNAs that would be regulated by KDM4 over cell cycle, and uh, by chip seq to look at histone marks th throughout the genome over cell cycle as well, and to see how that would be changing when we overexpress KDM4. So um, what we decided to do was to develop some method, and it's more like an adaptation of methods that already existed, but be able to. Um, adapt them to low number of cells so that we could actually work with cells that were sorted uh, based on DNA content. Uh, so that's more of things that like I really developed toward the end of my postdoc um, because we really wanted to be able to do those genome-wide studies. So what we did is that we were just treating uh, cells with oxygen And so that will just, or, or like, or with, or even with PI, it works as well. And so you really just look at uh, the content of the DNA, then you sort them uh, by fax, looking at DNA content, and you just like collect. So you put your gates in the fax machine, and you and you collect uh, cells in those specific windows, and from there um, we adapted a whole bunch of. Um, protocols to be able to look at really genome-wide what the overexpression of KDM4 was doing. So then we did a taxic, which didn't need a lot of adaptation because a taxic works really well with a low number of cells. 
RNA-seq, that was also pretty straightforward because RNA-seq works with a low number of cells as well. Chip-seq really needed some uh, tweaking of adaptation to be able to work with low number of cells. So that took a little longer to build. Like that was a real adaptation and like published uh, the protocol in Star Protocol. So if anyone really wants to like be able to do some chip-seq on cells sorted uh, over cycle, uh, it's actually... Uh, it's, so it's 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 easily doable and like so we, we've we've published the protocol now and we most most also what we did was uh replication timing and so at the time uh, that required a lot of adaptation as well because at the time there was no protocol out there to be able to look uh, to do some um, replication timing sequencing uh, so there were like some protocol to do some replication timing and like use microarrays uh, but not sequencing. So that took a long time as well to be able really to uh, find a way to sequence a DNA in which you would have BRDU incorporated. Oh, okay, that, that's, so that's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. And like a lot of those um, enzymes that uh, that would like for sequencing, they do not work if the DNA is uh, has some BRDU incorporated in it. So that required some tw some tweaking as well, and uh, and that's the same things our replication timing sequencing protocol. Uh, we published it in Star Protocol uh, last year or the year before that, something like that. So that's uh, easy to find as well. Mm -hmm. And so what we did then is that with all of that, we had like cells that overexpress KDM4A, and we used diploid cells. So that's really you have only the KDM4 overexpression, and those are our P cells that a lot of people are using because they are known to be Stable, they are mostly deployed. Uh, and we did uh, RNA seq, attack seq, replication timing sequencing, and we uh, did chip seq for a whole bunch of histone marks. Um, so, really, a true multiomics story, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, that was like, uh, it, it was, I think it's my most expensive project thus far. Even in my lab, we've never done something that expensive yet. With the, all of those sequencing studies, it was uh, that it was, and, and after that, a lot of analysis, and we like collaborated really closely with um, Ruslan Sadrayev at MGH, which is still a very close collaborator for to, for all of those uh, analyses. And so, what we what we really found the the most interesting, uh, I mean, we we had like several findings through these studies, which is really the last bit of my postdoctoral work, which was uh, at least that's what I started when I was in John's lab that was published pretty recently. Um, and so what we really found is that um, against what you could have thought and what is mostly thought, which is like uh, replication timing will be correlated with expression of RNA, uh, being like that if you are early in S phase, you have like, there is like more expression compared. Uh, so like if, that's, if like the, the places of the genome that replicate early are more expressed than the ones that replicate later, which is, which is, which is true, but. Because they uh, can start earlier to be expressed? To be expressed, yes. And so, but what, what we found is that uh, a combination of, um, histone marks, if we look at all the combination of histone marks that we um, that we looked at, so, so, so if the combination of histone marks is actually more predictive of one place of the genome replicating early or late. Uh, so there is really like the, uh, there are really like some combinations that will, will tell you if like, and that, and that correlation of histone marks uh, works much better than actually just just expression um, of the genome, and so and so the, so we've observed things that were uh, pretty much known that uh, if like it's K twenty seven trimethyl, it has a tendency to replicate later. Uh, but something that we really uh, uncovered with these studies is that um, is because we also looked at the dimethylation of K thirty six. And that is something that is less studied. Oftentimes, people look at K20, K36 trimethyl, but yeah, a little that's the less classical mark of, of a transcribed uh, open reading frame. Oh, exactly. But a little less of the others, uh, K36 methylation mark like um, di and mono. 
And we looked at monodyne tribe because KDM4A demethylates. So with KDM4A will do demethylate K36 and K9, but it goes from the trimethyl to the dimethyl. Oh, KDM4 doesn't go below that. It's really die to try. So for K9 and K36, we really included all of the uh, methylation states because we were also really interested in the other methylation states for those. And what we really found is that there is a whole part of the genome that is a K36 dimethyl, and that part of the genome replicate, replicates more in the middle of S phase. And so... And so what we did also, something that we did a little differently into our replication timing experiments is that most of the time, people that do replication timing sequencing, they take the early S phase and the late S phase. So they divide S phase in two big fractions. Uh, what we did is that we divided in four. Uh, and so, so we had more time, more data points. And what we found is that we actually found there is a lot of, you get more precision. And so you have all of that middle of S phase in which we actually found that KDM4 mostly was acting there through that K36 dye state. And it's really more in the middle of S phase. And so we found that there is like a really um, important percentage of the genome that is really as altered replication if you overexpress KDM4 A. But if we looked at only early and late, uh, which we did as well in comparison, then we don't see anything really. We see only 2% of the genome changes and like we don't see anything really for K36. You really need to go more in details to be able to find all of these uh, all of these changes. So there is a, still a lot of things to do uh, there as well. And um, John's lab is really like continuing to do like on other chromatin modifiers and uh, to expand there as well, because a lot of different um, histone marks will have various function on replication timing and also on a DNA copy gain, like they are seeing in, in his lab. Mm -hmm. So next to, or let's say the last thing I want to talk about is that you also moved away from KDM4A and you investigated the effects of SWI sniff mutations on cellular sensitivity to T cellular sensitivity to specific drugs. So uh, how did it come that you switched or that you also moved into this area? And uh, what did you find then by investigating this? So, so that's when I started my, my own uh, laboratory here at Stanford. And so when I moved from John's lab, uh, I left uh, KDM4A behind and I left I left that in his own lab. So in my lab, we don't do any uh, KDM4A work directly. So we finished up things that we were doing from uh, in his lab and some postdoc work. But uh, but here we are really moving on different things. And um, so I started the lab with two different angles, which recapitulate way well what we've talked about so far is the translation angle that I had done with KDM4A, which I had found like those role in translation and the cell cycle uh, replication timing and all of that cell cycle angle. And so um, and so to talk more about SWI sniff, um, the way that all started, which is, you know, it's a never the way that you write a paper. So you will not be able to know if you were reading the paper on SWI sniff, how all of that started. Or how, um, you planned, how you planned it. <laughs> you planned, like, how would you plan to find rules for SWI sniff in translation? Well, the thing is that uh, when I was still in John's lab, um, so all, all of that KDM4 I work in translation, when we, pub we published that and actually stopped working on it for the simple reason that we wanted to develop those methods, those cell cycle method, uh, to be able to do some a lot of sequencing. And I could not do it all. So I told John at the time, well, if you want to develop those methods, I need to be full-time on that. I cannot work on KDM4 in translation anymore. So we have to make a choice. But so this is how I stopped working on KDM4 in translation, basically, is to be able to develop all of the other methods that I did towards the end of my postdoc. But anyway, so when that KDM4 work in translation was published, um, and we had two papers published uh, on that, I was... So back at the time, I thought there is no way 
I got lucky to a point that I found the quote-unquote chromatin modifier that has other roles, like in the cytoplasm in translation. I, you know, I don't believe in that kind of luck. Absolutely not. So there must be others. So when I was still in John's lab, I took some... Uh, so I was doing polysome profiling all the time then for that KDM4 I work. And so I did some polysome profiling in, in 2 and 3 t cells. And I took some initiating fractions from polysome profiling and we uh, sent that for my spec. And then I had like... And I looked what was in there, thinking like, well, then I can start my own lab looking at other things in there. And so if you look in that list, we had like so many hits from the swipe sniff complexes. So many hits. So when we started the lab, um, one of the first postdocs that started that really wanted to join the lab to do some work on translation, uh, then I told her, well, that's kind of high risk, high reward. It's soy sniff. So because it's soy sniff, it's pretty hot. It's going to be interesting because people are really interested in soy sniff. So much altered in cancer. And in the end, we are doing cancer research. So... So I would, I told her, if I were you, I will start two projects, some things that we know it's going to work, like, so we're safe. But if I were you, I will take that soy new thing and go look, really, because it's just mass spec from polysome profiling that we had done. So could be some artifact, could be like, you know, um, so this is, so that's how that's how she started that. So she did some confirmation, co-IPs, okay, it interacts with the translation. Uh, we uh, fractionations with the seat in the cytoplasm. Um, and really, I think the experiment where I got totally convinced was when we did some uh, drug treatment and when we used those bromodomain inhibitors and we put these uh, inhibitors on cells for 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes of treatment, we see a global decrease of translation. And then like, is it, then after 10 minutes, it cannot be consequences of their role in transcription. You don't have time to transcribe, export, translate in only 10 minutes. A small RNA is going to take 20. So, so then it really ruled out, I mean, it just confirmed that they also had direct roles in translation. And, and then this is where we took um, that story. And like the lab is still very actively working uh, on that now to try to really understand what are they doing in translation in the cytoplasm? Are the complexes the same? Do the different complexes have different function there? How does that relate to the rules in transcription? It must be linked somehow. If there are rules like in transcription and in translation for gene expression, there must be a reason they are on both sides and there must be some commonality. So now we are trying also to bring all of that back in the nucleus, I guess doing more a little bit of truly epigenetic work, I guess, mm -hmm. to see really what is the um, what are the commonality here and what it is doing. And mostly what we do as well is to try to understand the consequences uh, in cancer because we found that the roles in translation are actually relevant in cancer. And so how they are altered. And, and so we do, we start to have like some interesting findings around that side as well. And like, but yeah, the lab being very cancer centric, I think there will be a lot of also roles, developmental roles, because SWISNIP is highly involved in the de development. So I think the roles in translation will also be uh, relevant there. Uh, although it's not, it's not a, uh, something that we're pursuing at the time. I wish I could do everything at the same time, you know? <laughs> You just But need more people, right? <laughs> we do need more people. Yes, we always need more people, more money, and like. But we we are like we are set for like many years of research. We could do, we could be doing only that in the lab, which is but which is not the case. We we are actually also doing other things which are more truly epigenetic. Yeah, this already answered like my second to last question. So, what are you currently working on, and what are your plans for the next five years? So that basically covered everything, right? Or is there anything that you that, didn't mention? That pretty much covers everything on that side, because we are really expanding on, as I just said, what are really so still doing in translation? How does it relate to other roles? What like how is it altered in diseases? So this is really something we are we are actively pursuing, and like I think. 
I think the entire lab could be working on that pretty much forever. Uh, but we are actually expanding to other chromatin modifiers as well. And like we have reasons to think there is more there. Uh, so we uh, we intend to um, expand uh, to that as well. So like if like we have like um, some trainees coming at some point that are interested in like doing a little bit on different than soy sniff and starting on new uh, new factors. Um, and so, but so, but the, it's that's that's actually not the only thing that we do in the lab. Uh, when I started the lab, I was telling you we started on that the translation angle, but also the cell cycle angle. And on that cell cycle angle, uh, what uh, I really wanted to do when I started my lab was to uh, try to understand uh, the differences between uh, those K27 and mutant in those uh, brain cancer in children, which are now called diffuse midline glioma K27 mutants. Um, and so, and so, uh, and I thought that uh, by looking at them in a cell cycle centric point of view, we might uh, uncover new findings and like see really what, uh, what they are doing there. So we have an entire, there is like an entire part of the lab that actually working on K27 mutation which is like very far from translation. <laughs> and, uh, and like, it's actually, I guess it's not that far from soy sniff because like K27 being like more pure C2 and pure C2 is the antagonism of soy sniff. So I guess it's not that far from soy sniff. Uh, but uh, so we have like a whole part of the lab that's actually studying those K27 and mutants. And we are trying to understand the differences between H3.1 K27M and H3.3 K27M. Because those two histones can be found mutated in those uh, patients, in those children, but they have either the mutation of one or the other, and uh, and it seems from like several publications out there and findings that there will be two subgroups of patients, uh, and so that's like the mutations and they don't arise exactly at the same age. Like H three point one arises a little earlier. So there is some nice work from Nada Jabado that shows us it could be the different cell of origin. Uh, and so we really are interested in finding differences in between those two um, histone mutants uh, and to see really uh, functionally what they are doing. And there we are really looking at them really through the cell cycle uh, and see if they have like uh, cell cycle specific function or if there are things that change really over the cell cycle. And like, and so we... I thought we should be looking into that because one of the main difference, as you know, between H3.1 and H3.3 is uh, their expression of our cycle. H3.1 being a replicative histone, it's only expressed in S phase, where H3.3, the variant, is expressed throughout the cell cycle. So we thought that looking at them with a cell cycle, cell cycle centric point of view might lead us to like some specific function, at least for those mutations. So that's that's coming along pretty well, and we should have a first story on those K twenty seven mutant coming out, I think, next year. So that's like oh yeah. So then we are looking forward to reading more of that. Yes. So in the last forty minutes, we have taken a journey through your scientific career. Um, did we miss something along the way? I don't think so. I think we really went through uh, through everything, even those K twenty seven mutants now. So uh, Great. so I think we really, co we really covered it all. Um, can you maybe uh, give us a short summary about what you would consider your most important finding? Oof. Oh, um, to finish my, this <laughs> trip I, oh, about your My side. most important finding, that's hard. I mean, to pick one thing, um, I guess for, I think I will say for the things that I've been like, Uh, already published now, uh, what I would consider maybe not the most important, but I think what I find at least the most exciting are all of these new roles in translation, because that's really something that's totally new uh, and that was not really studied before. So it's like we are creating our new niche there and we are really starting. And I think there is a lot to do and that's going to be a really a new area and a new field of research or those like factors that are also in the cytoplasm and have some roles in translation. So I think this is most of what, yeah, if, if I had to pick one, I will say that just because I like 
things that are a little different and just follow where the science go and like and I I think more new things like that might come at some point from the lab as well just because you know just just follow the science this is the most exciting okay so thank you Cappuccini for your time and for being on this show thank you very much thanks for listening to this episode of the epigenetics podcast from active motif we hope you enjoyed it you can find all the mentioned references in the show notes please rate review and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. We'd love to hear from you, so please send us your feedback on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or via email at podcast at activemotif.com, and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. For more great epigenetics content, check out the Active Motif blog at activemotif.com forward slash blog. Thanks for listening and stay tuned.